so students uh, we already studied about the administrative apparatus or otherwise the administrative system of delhi sultanate and uh, uh, we have a familiarization of the important wing of administration and different uh, branches of administration of something and today uh, we have a study on the uh, the muslim theory of taxes or the revenue policies followed by the delhi sultanate while making an overall analysis of the revenue policy or taxation policy of the delhi sultanate we have to make an argument that the economic system or economic policies of delhi sultanate was not derived from a single source it was influenced by various economic theories or policies followed by uh, different dynasties uh, based on central asia byzantine empire the persian practices turkish practices all that have an impact on the revenue policy of delhi sultanate basically they followed an economic theory that was propounded by hanafi school hanafi school of economy that was prevailed in central asia especially that of the abbas at the time hanafi school of economy so the economic policy taxation policy of islamic state that was highly influenced by the economic policy of hanafi school of economy the revenue under delhi sultanate was basically divided into two one that is secular tax or fair tax secular tax or fair tax and otherwise uh, that is of religious tax or zakat the term zakat is very familiar to you uh, now in a different way this practice is followed by the believers of islam so basically the tax or revenue sources of delhi sultan can be divided into two one that is secular tax or fair tax and another one that is of religious tax or zakat under the umbrella of secular tax or fair tax uh we had to include a tax named jizya then again karaj and kams basically uh, these taxes were imposed on the non muslim community secular tax or fair tax were imposed on the non muslim community second category uh, that is of sarkar sarkar was a tax levied from the muslims it was not compulsory but that was an obligatory tax uh, it is believed that the sarkat is a tax or an obligatory tax as part of an obligation between the gold and the individual there is an argument that the sarkat that is a donation that was given by the rich muslim families to poor muslims who were not belongs to the hashim family hashim family or the clans those who were members they were not the members of hashim family or the clans and at the same time they were economically not in a sound position uh, they received uh, donations in the form of money and material from the rich muslim families and rulers so that kind of obligatory tax pious tax that is known as sakat but there are different arguments regarding the nature of sakat and 
Tribadi made an argument that it was not uh, a tax uh, or a donation given to the poor, but it was a kind of tax imposed on the flocks, that means uh, cattle, herds, commercial capital, gold, silver, agriculture produce. So, Tribadi make an argument that the Sakkat was a general tax that was imposed on the cattle herds, that was imposed on the commercial capital, gold and silver and agricultural produce. And uh, it, it, that was a tax basically uh, emerged out of the system of feudalism and this tax that was followed by the Islamic State also the Tith uh, that was the another form of Sarkats Tith was a form of Sarkat that was charged on land, wheat, barley, rice and lentils so land, wheat, barley, rice, lentils so the products in the Malay Chumatiya or the tax side down the Gomida Malay Chumatiya or the tax side down the Tith will end up in the and uh, uh, under the category of fair tax or secular tax, we identified Jazia, Karaj and Kam. So basically, there is an argument that uh, the Islamic State demanded military and civil support of the citizens. All the citizens of an Islamic State was or were bound to serve the cause of the state. Those who are inhabiting in an Islamic state, they should render the service to their rulers. So, some of the people who were physically not in a position, they were religious because of the religious inhibition, they were not in a position to serve the state. Those who were incapable of serving the cause of the state or serving the interest of the state, they were bound to pay a particular tax. That was Jazia. That is one argument. That is a one argument concerned with the Jazia. And uh, one of the important aspects of the tax system of Delhi Sultanate was tax was imposed according to the repayment capacity of the people. Repayment capacity of the people. It was not universal in nature. For example, you can see that uh, 48 dirham that was to be paid by the rich classes. 24 dirhams that was to be paid by the middle classes and 12 dirhams annually from the poor classes. So the tax was imposed according to the economic status of the different classes of the society. And under the uh, secular tax, another important one we notice that is of Karaj. Karaj was a type of land tax that was very important revenue source and that was mainly imposed on the non-Muslim community. Come, that we mean spoils of the war. In connection with the war, uh, bar duty that were collected or large number of products were confiscated from the defeated rulers. So, the spoils of the war that is known as come. And uh, 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 while studying about the land revenue policy or land tax, uh, we can see that uh, there was much fluctuation. There was much fluctuations in the uh, land revenue collected by the Delhi Sultans. The land revenue that was uh, depend upon the natural conditions. Uh, so the sometimes uh, some of the Sultans uh, they face the impending uh, danger from the Mongols or something. Uh, that is why uh, land revenue that was much fluctuated. For example, uh, during the time of Alaudi Kalji, uh, half of the revenue, half of the products uh, 
uh, that was collected as the taxes. Now uh, we have to make a study on modes of assessment. Assessment of the land or assessment of the uh, property or assessment of the products. So it was the assessment of the agricultural products. It was the assessment of the land and property tax that was imposed. There are three kind of assessment system. One that is sharing, second one that is of appraisal, appraisement, and third one is that of measurement. Sharing, appraisement, and measurement are three type of uh, assessment. Sharing that naturally means sharing of the products between the uh, peasants and the king. So when the uh, agriculture that was produced, the crops, the crops or agrarian products that was shared, that was shared between the peasants and the ruler. So we only make a comment that the allowed in Kalji collected the half of the products as his share. So sharing, sharing of the products, one of the important methods. So there is slight difference between appraisement and share. The case of appraisement and measurement, proper measurement or proper appraisement of the products, especially that of agrarian products that was made by the intermediaries or officials appointment by the rulers. So when agricultural produce that was created or crops that was made, it was measured how much quantity it had or how much quantity it had uh, that was made by the state officials appointed by the Sultan and on the basis of the measurement of the products tax that was imposed. So there are three kind of assessment system, one that is sharing, another one that is of appraisement and third one is that of measurement. So that is the basic knowledge that we have about the tax system under the Delhi Sultanate. And now we have to make a study on the military structure or army under the Delhi Sultanate. We already explained that Delhi Sultanate was laid on the strong foundation offered by the army. Basically, a military despotism that was prevailed in the Islamic State. Military despotism. We make a comment about the gunpowder and virus, uh, the use of artillery, use of cavalry, how far the cavalry and the artillery provided much advantage to the Delhi Sultans to overrun the ambitions of other rulers. So the military organization was based on Turkish model. Turkish model was based on decimal system. Decimal system. That means uh, multiple of 10. Multiple of 10. So basic unit of the army that composed of 10 soldiers. Next multiple that is of hundreds. Next multiple that is of thousands. So, uh, Turkish model that offered the uh, uh, based on decimal system and uh, the army of Delhi Sultan was based on the decimal system. King who became the commander in chief of the army and we already studied about the head of the military, Aris E. Mumalik, Department of Military that is known as Divani Ars and other prominent officials of the army that is of Amir, then again Malik, Khans, they are the prominent uh, military officials. And uh, uh, we studied about the uh, Ikta system. Ikta system, 
that was uh, followed by the uh, Delhi Sultans. In uh, India, uh, the Sikta system that was introduced by Iltumish. Iltta system means paying of the soldiers, paying of the soldiers, uh, the form of land, land donation. Assignment of land to the chief military officers in lieu of paying in cash. Number of the sample of Panama in the Pagan, Bumi, when a sample of Mayan and Pagan in the Idia and Ita system. But during the time of Aladdin Kaji, he formed a strong standing army, uh, Ita system uh, that was not followed by him. He paid. Uh, the soldiers in cash. And uh, uh, during this time of Aladdin Kilji recruitment was a highly centralized process. Dag and Chahara, you know Dag and Chahara, that means um, uh, maintaining of the descriptive role of the soldiers. Uh, then again, branding of the forces, that means Dag and Chahara practice. Uh, centralized army, all that became the contribution of the Alauddin Kalji. So, Sultans, uh, they introduced some sort of reforms in the field of uh, military. R.S.C. Mumalik who became the head of the army. All the Sultans, with the exception of uh, Russia, uh, who served as the commander in uh, chief of the army, uh, Amir Yaqub, uh, who became the another prominent official, who was in charge of the royal stables. And uh, uh, we studied that mode of payment uh, that was varied according to sultans. Some of the sultans paid in the form of land, and sultans like Alauddin Kilji paid the soldiers in cash. And uh, normally, uh, 234 tankers uh, a year for a soldier was a normal and of course was a normal rate offered by Allah Ji. 234 tankers that was given to a soldier who was maintaining a post. And uh, during the time of Yerusha Tuklak, the cash payment was abolished by him and he again uh, for, or he revived the practice of the uh, ICTA system and uh, cavalry that became a very important part of uh, Sultan army along with the cavalry elephants some of the Sultans gave more importance to the maintaining of the elephants large number of, you know even the present day some of the books uh, that were written uh, based on the role of elephants uh, in medieval India and uh, during the time of Balban, one elephant is equal to 500 horse. One elephant is equal to 500 uh, horse. And medieval record point out that uh, Muhammad is who maintained uh, 3000 elephants and uh, a special officer named Shan E. Pil. Shan E. Pil that was appointed by Muhammad bin Tukluk for the maintenance of the army. And one of the important features of the Delhi Sultanate state was that of the construction of the force. The security of the country or security of the region that was maintained by the construction of the large number of forts. In every part of the Delhi Sultanate you have to identify the forts including the, uh, now the well forts uh, something. And uh, uh, for the uh, maintaining of the security of the cities a special officer named Kutwal uh, uh, was appointed. So, uh, these are the basic knowledge uh, that we have about uh, the army of Turkish Sultanates. And now uh, we have a very brief study on the provincial government uh, of uh, Delhi Sultanate. Basically, Byzantine and Persian model uh, that was followed by the Delhi Sultans for the administration of the provinces and uh, provincial administration that became a replica or a uh, model uh, 
saying that of the uh, central uh, state uh, governors uh, who were very powerful uh, in a particular uh, provinces so there are basically uh, there are two kinds of provinces some of the provinces were very small and uh, that is very close to the capital city some of the provinces were very small are directly controlled by the sultan of his immediate relatives or his son uh, meerut delhi agra so lahor multan these were some of the state or cities very small and directly controlled by the delhi sultans but some of the provinces like that of bengal gujarat and dakkan that were far away far away from the capital cities and uh, uh, the sultans maintained the control over this kind of provinces like that of bengal gujarat and dakkan in an indirect manner indirect manner so in this way two kinds of uh, uh, provinces uh, that we have to uh, identify special officials like that of amir uh, who were appointed and um, provinces were again divided into parganas uh, it is argued that uh, during the time of ferosha tughlaq there were 52 parganas 52 parganas and uh, parganas were again divided into villages villages were known as kasba so the provinces were divided into parganas and parganas were again divided into villages that is popularly known as kasba kasba or villages that became the basic unit of uh, administration and uh, uh, ibn battuta identified um, a kind of villages uh, that is known as sadi s a d i sadi means uh, a collection of 100 villages collection of 100 villages were known as uh, sadi and uh, uh, the power structure by looking the power structure of the villages you can see that uh, mukka dam courts chowderis uh, village headman they were very powerful in the uh, provinces so now today we studied about the uh, taxation policy of delhi sultanates then again uh, military setup and we make a uh, brief overview on the Uh, provincial administration of uh, Delhi Sultanate.